Today, we're going to continue our discussion on generative models and wrap it up. OK, so recall, uh, we looked at three challenges. Right? We looked at uh, representation learning of individual local elements within your modalities, like just individual word with the individual object region. We looked at alignment that takes into account multiple elements across your modalities. For example, multiple words in a sentence aligned with multiple image regions that are words maybe referring to the image. We saw reasoning, how to combine the information in a structured, logical, causal, interpretable way. But now we're talking about generation, right? Previously, the three challenges were all in the context of making predictions, more in the supervised learning case. Now we're going to talk about um, generating more data. And we saw three big patterns of gener generation. The first being more summarization. We have lots of larger amounts of multimodal data with greater information content. For example, a video, and you want to summarize it into the most important, perhaps one image or a short description of that. Another big application paradigm is translation, translating from one modality to the other while maintaining the information content, exploring the fact that there is uh, the exact semantic meaning shared between both modalities that you're translating to and from. And finally, creation, right? Um, the goal of starting from something smaller, like a latent variable or perhaps one image, and generating more data that is coherent in those modalities. And we saw two big dimensions of uh, typically when you're trying to design generative models, you want to consider these two dimensions. The first dimension is how is the information content changing? Is it being reduced? Is it being maintained? Or is it being expanded? And typically, these information contents exist because there are some connections between your modalities, connections due to uh, associations between them, but also semantically because we know that there's correspondences between them. All the work on connections that we talked about. So when we look at the information content, it's all about these connections, whether we're reducing these connections. For example, many things are connected, but we're just picking the pair that is the most salient, uh, whether you're maintaining these connections. For example, you want to maintain all the connections in the image and the caption, if you want to make a perfect translation of it when you're doing image captioning, or you're expanding these connections. You're starting from one image and a word, but you want to generate a whole video with a whole transcript that has more connections between them. And of course, all this is only possible if you have the right data, right? If you have the right data that tells you how you should summarize from big to small or translate or expand your data. The second dimension that we talked about was more on the generative process. Uh, the generative process tells us exactly how I'm generating my data. And one paradigm is more example-based. If I have a dictionary of translations, can I then retrieve into this dictionary and tell me how I should translate something uh, new. These example-based methods, um, they're limited because it depends on how many pairs you have in your dictionary. Um, so that's your limitation. But a good thing about them is that they won't hallucinate. You're guaranteed to get something reliable because you're based on a dictionary. Generative models, on the other hand, also start with a dictionary of paired data, but you're learning a generative process that actually enables you to translate arbitrary data from the one modality to data in the other modality. So typically, you're using this dictionary during training to learn a translation model. And during testing, you will then just put your data into the translation model. You're no longer limited by what you can put in and what elements are in a dictionary, which is good. But a disadvantage is that you can then tend to hallucinate. Uh, we have this like mode collapse problem where if you haven't seen a particular dictionary pair for that input data, you most likely won't be able to generate from it too well. It requires you to still have good coverage and how many dictionary elements you started off with in training this generative model. Right, so last, uh, on Tuesday, we talked a little bit about applications of generation and we looked at autoregressive models, right? Which is a way of generating data word by word or pixel by pixel, like your language models and how to condition those language models to uh, look at images when they're generating text. Today, we're gonna go deeper into other generative models, mostly these probabilistic generative models. Uh, they're also typically called latent variable models. They're called latent variable models because you have natural data, for example, images, text, very high dimensional, uh, very rich, but usually we can't model the full distribution in pixel space. That's way too difficult. So in a lot of these generative models, we're gonna make some assumption where instead of modeling uh, my data X and a distribution of X, I'm gonna model a simple distribution Z. This Z is typically called latent variables. They can be much smaller dimensional much more compact, perhaps even discrete, that represents the most salient features in X. So my X's faces, for example, I can define my latent variable Z to be um, the gender, 
the background, the color of the hair, color of the eyes, uh, whether it's front or from the side and so on. And you can think, even though my space of images X is huge, almost impossible to enumerate, um, there are just a fixed small number of latent variables Z that allow me to describe the image. Of course, not perfectly, but you know, to the precision that I want. So typically these latent variable models look like this, right? There are some latent variables, we call them latent because they're unobserved. You typically don't have annotations for them. You have to learn them from your data, but X is observed, your natural data is observed. And you have a process that takes in some Z, which is much smaller dimensional and using that to generate. Okay. For example, here, uh, gender, eye color, hair color, pose together are four latent variables that you might use to generate uh, images of faces. So latent variable models therefore work in this fashion where you define some distribution of a Z and because Z is smaller, it's um, something that we can choose. You can put something simple, a simple prior like a normal distribution or a categorical distribution if Z is discrete. So Z is something you can choose. You can choose something to be as simple as possible to make your life easier. And afterwards, you can define X given Z, right? How my data is actually generated from these latent variables. And X given Z, again, uh, is something you can choose. Typically, people choose them nowadays as neural networks, right? Taking in some latent variables, small in dimension, through some parameters data to output a distribution over your data X. And normally, you will see things like um, the X given Z distribution is not deterministic. So there's not a single mapping from Z to X like you normally see through a multi-layer neural network, or they try to learn a distribution of X from Z. So distribution can be seen as learning a parameter for the mean and a parameter for the variance. And you can define distribution as a Gaussian using the learned mean and learned variance. The good thing about learning a distribution is that you can sample arbitrary number of data points from it, right? From the same, for example, same Z, so same eye color and same uh, frontal facing images, you can not just get one image, but you can get a distribution of images from which you can sample many faces corresponding to those latent variables. Uh, typically, there are other good benefits of using these latent variable models. Ideally, if you've learned Z well, they should also correspond to these meaningful latent factors, in which case you can then do classification. If I want to detect eye color, if I want to detect the person is smiling, or angry, you should be able to use X to infer Z. Right? And these features could then be useful for your predictive tasks. And finally, given a new Z, you can generate a new X. Given a new setting, for example, smiling, but there's different eye color from the side, you should be able to generate new faces. So in fact, I'm gonna go through um, three classes of latent variable models, each with increasing difficulty. Uh, the first one, is the easiest, make sure of Gaussians, right? Um, you assume that Z is categorical. So there is just a list of categorical features um, that represent your latent variables. For example, smiling, not smiling from the side, from the front, and so on. And your X given Z, your data, your data distribution given Z is a simple Gaussian with just a mean parameter and a variance parameter. So your data will end up looking like this. If it's two-dimensional, you essentially have, for example, three, uh, three items in your categorical setting for Z, one, two, and three, in which case your distribution will either be uh, the first Gaussian distribution from the first Z, the second Gaussian distribution, or the third Gaussian distribution. Right. So your generative process for a new data point will be first sample something according to Z, for example, sample um, this eye color and smiling, and then generate, uh, take the Gaussian corresponding to that Z, which has their own mean and variance. So let's say you pick this one in red. So that's the Gaussian corresponding to Z. That's P of X given that Z. And in that case, you can then get new data point X by just sampling from that Gaussian. Right? And it's easy to sample from Gaussians. So make sure of Gaussians, right? The name is chosen because there are multiple Gaussians and your whole data distribution, your entire X distribution is a mixture of these individual Gaussians. And you can fit your data reasonably well, right? If you have X, Y data, two dimensions distributed like this, you can fit a mixture of Gaussians. It allows you to actually isolate the different components, right? Uh, orange, green, and red, according to the mixture of Gaussians that you learn. And you've probably seen how to learn it. You can write out the distribution of your data, P of X, 
and the summation over z, your joint distribution p of x and z. Uh, you can then factorize p of x given z, and p of x and z into first sampling p of z, it's a categorical distribution, and then sampling p of x given z. Right, that is the Gaussian means and variances given the particular z categorical distribution that you've chosen. And in which case, you can actually compute this pretty easily because your p of z is just probability that you belong to that categorical variable. So probability that your eye color is this, probability that the image is from the side or from the front. That's p of z given your particular k. And given that k, your p of x given z is just a Gaussian. A Gaussian is normally distributed with some mean and some variance. And the trainable parameters are the mean and the variance. So how do you learn it? You can actually use expectation maximization. Uh, essentially iterate two steps. The first step is that if I have a particular setting of my mean and variances, so that means I tell you I have three Gaussians, one with this mean and variance, one with this mean and variance, one with this mean and variance. Given these three Gaussians, I can estimate for a new data point the distribution, which is the, the likelihood that it falls under each of these three Gaussians. Are right, essentially looking at which Gaussian it is closest to in mean and surrounded by that variance. So given my particular setting of Gaussians, I can estimate uh, what likelihood it falls under each Gaussian. That's the expectation step. And if I have the likelihood that my data falls under each Gaussian, I can then use that to update the means and variances. That's essentially a clustering problem. Right? If I know these 10 data points fall right into this Gaussian, these other 15 data points fall into this Gaussian, these 20 data points fall into the third Gaussian, I can then update the three Gaussian mean and variances by estimating them using maximum likelihood. So the good thing about this is that your P of Z is simple to define. My P of X given Z is simple. More importantly, this summation over Z is also simple. My summation over Z is basically just summing over the categories that Z can take in. The summation over K. That's simple. You can compute the entire log likelihood of my data. I can maximize this log likelihood with respect to the actual observed data points. Mixture of Gaussians. First, simple latent variable model. So of course, latent variable models like, like mixture of Gaussians are great, but it's very limiting, right? All you're getting is uh, three Gaussians with static fixed means and variances. It doesn't really allow you that much flexibility in your data. Typically, you want something more expressive where Z may not just be a categorical, one of K features. You want Z to be maybe 32 dimensional continuous representations, make it compatible with deep learning. So Z is typically gonna be harder to enumerate over. And my P of X given Z is also not just telling me the means and variances uh, that are static, but rather dependent on Z. So dependent on a latent variable Z, I might have a new distribution of X. Another setting of latent variable Z, I might have a different distribution over X. Essentially saying that uh, my distribution of X given Z would be a Gaussian distribution that takes in Z as an input and learns the distribution over the new mean and a new variance for that P of X given that particular Z, right? So now we're, you can recall we're kind of going into auto encoder space where Z could be some latent variables and I'm gonna use the latent variables to transform it into the mean and variance of my data distribution from which I sample X. So in fact, this can be very expressive, right? So even though P of X given Z is just a neural network that takes in Z and outputs your mean and variance, my entire P of X, which would be the summation over all Z, P of Z, P of X given Z can be very complex. You're essentially marginalizing over many, many, many neural networks. Each neural network, one neural network for one particular setting of Z. So it's much more expressive, right? But the difficulty is that it's also much harder to learn. If I want to do the same thing, I want to write out the log likelihood of my data, P of X, uh, with the trainable parameters data. Those are my neural network parameters that go from Z to X. If I want to write out my log likelihood of my data and maximize the log likelihood with respect to the observed data set, I'm going to do the same thing, right? Um, summation over data points X in my data set, P of X and theta with trainable parameters. Now I want to introduce Z into the picture because my model actually has both Z and X. You will add the summation over Z, P of X, Z and theta. And this is very difficult because essentially your summation over Z is almost impossible. If Z is even binary with 30 dimensions, the summation over Z will be two to the 30 terms. If Z is continuous, like you typically have 
in your autoencoders with latent spaces, then the integrals are possible. Right. So going from Gaussian mixture models to VAEs will be essentially replacing your Z from categorical to either larger dimension, discrete or continuous, in which case the summation over Z is impossible. How do we then do it? So variational inference is a general paradigm that allows us to solve things like this. Anytime you see a distribution P, which is too complex, like the one we saw here, not able to compute exactly, requires summation or integral over many different things. Variational inference basically says, I'm going to introduce a new distribution Q. And this distribution Q should be tunable, right? You can essentially search over the best distribution Q, tunable with parameters five. And the whole goal of learning this distribution Q is that you want to essentially find the best Q that is simple, yet matches the P that you try to optimize. P is exactly hard to compute exactly. I'm going to find a simpler distribution Q that is much simpler. I can compute it exactly, but still close to the P that I actually care about. So visually, it might look like something like this, right? I have this um, uh, distribution blue, which is pretty ugly. Maybe this distribution in blue is something that you can't compute exactly. I'm going to try to use simple distributions Q. And when I, people say simple, they usually mean Gaussian with learnable means and variances. I'm going to try to define a simple distribution Q that still is very close to my original distribution P, but simpler, right? So here I have two candidates, one in green. That could be a distribution Q. That's a Gaussian, simple. Uh, this orange could also be a distribution Q, also pretty simple. But which one should I choose? I should choose orange, because orange is much closer to the blue P that I care about. Right. So variational inference. A general paradigm, you're going to see this a lot in, in any generative model, in any probabilistic model, when you have distributions that are hard to compute, hard to optimize, like P, find a simpler distribution Q that is as close to P as possible while remaining simple. So Q can have its own set of parameters, right? Q can be a Gaussian with its own set of trainable parameters, phi, maybe for the mean, another phi for the variance, and essentially choosing Q to be as close to P as possible and still remaining simple can be seen as optimization problem over the parameters in Q, over the parameters phi in Q. OK? So at a high level, um, how are we going to exactly do this approximation? So this L is my log likelihood of my data. That's the one that we said was uh, P of x under the observed data. That's really hard to compute. I'm going to rewrite this P of x as two things, a lower bound involving my parameters theta. So that's the parameters originally involved in the log likelihood and phi. Phi is a new set of variational parameters I introduce in order to learn Q to be close to P, right? So I'm gonna write it as a function of this lower bound. This lower bound should be computable easily and some gap. This gap is essentially, I'm gonna give up, right? Of course, I'm not gonna be able to compute P exactly. I'm gonna choose something that is easier to compute. That's my lower bound and a gap, the cap, I give up. There's no way I'm gonna be able to compute it exactly. But ideally, you want the gap to be as small as possible. So you wanna be able to get the lower bound, easily computable with some gap that you give up. The gap should be as small as possible so you don't lose too much accuracy. And as a general way of writing this decomposition into the lower bound that is easily computable and the gap, so we're gonna derive it later in the next slide. But essentially for any distribution Q, which is this new set of variational distribution with parameters phi. If you recall, that's a distribution that you try to make as simple as possible while still following P. You can write out the li likelihood as a term that depends on my original P and my Q. This is usually called evidence lower bound, plus some gap. This gap is typically not computable, but hopefully if my choice of Q is good, this gap is gonna be small. I can ignore it from now on, okay? So what does this decomposition actually look like? Uh, the proof is actually pretty simple. So I'm gonna write out my log likelihood. That's my P of X under the data that I observe. This P of X, I'm gonna write it as an expectation over Q, log P of X. I'm gonna do some uh, algebra where I multiply P of Z given X on the top and the bottom, introduce Z into the picture. So P of X times P of Z given X become P of X and Z. And the bottom I also have a P of Z given X. I'm going to then multiply and divide by Q of Z given X on the top and the bottom. 
And after rearranging, I basically get two terms, right? The first term is essentially an expectation under my simple distribution Q. What is the ratio of my P, which is the original distribution I care about, divided by the distribution of Q, which is the simple distribution I'm using to approximate P, right? The second distribution, the second term that I get is a KL between Q, which is a distribution that I choose to approximate P, and P itself, the one that was hard to compute. Essentially telling me how close uh, this new distribution I've chosen to be simple is to the actual difficult distribution. Right. The first term is to be called evidence lower bound. That tells me under my new distribution Q, what how close my Q is to fulfilling the data distribution P. And the second term is a posterior gap. Typically, you can think of Q also as um, an encoder that takes in input X, passes them through some parameters phi, and outputs a distribution of a latent variable Z. And in which case, the evidence lower bound, learning this evidence lower bound can be seen as training the encoder. The posterior gap, which is a gap between my distribution Q that I choose and the actual distribution P is typically uncomputable. We're gonna ignore it from now on, but ideally if you chose Q to be close to P, then this term will be small. Okay. And just a little bit more about KL. Um, the KL between Q and P, two distributions, is a measure of how close they are. And it's actually asymmetric, so it depends on which term happens first in a KL, which terms happen second in a KL. So KL between Q and P will be the integral between integral over Q, log Q divided by P. So there's actually three cases. If Q is small, so if Q, the proposal distribution that I choose to be simple, wherever Q is small, it doesn't matter what's inside the log. This first term is going to be small. My whole term over here is going to be small. So it doesn't care what happens inside. You don't actually compare Q and P. When Q is high, so this Q of Z is large, then you have to compare Q and P. Okay, the term inside is going to matter. So when Q and P are both similar, and they're both high, then you're good. This log ratio becomes small. But when your Q is large, but your P is small, so Q assigns high distributions to places where your original P distribution doesn't give, then this Q over P is going to be large, and you're going to incur a high penalty. So essentially what you're saying is that P is a distribution that is very complicated all over the place. That you started with, I'm going to introduce a distribution Q that at least covers one of the modes in P. Right? At least it's big when one of the parts of P is big. The other parts of P that are big, but if Q is small, Q doesn't cover it, then I'm still not going to incur any penalty. Make sense? So this KO, the order of the KO actually matters because it's saying that Q is a simple distribution. Q may not have to touch every part of P, but at least the parts which Q and P overlap, they should match. All right, so that's the idea behind this second KO over here. So this first evidence lower bound, I said that it should be easy to compute, right? The KL should be hard to compute, I can throw it away, but the evidence lower bound should be something easy to compute so that I can actually learn my parameters. So why is it actually easy to compute? Well, just a little bit more rearranging of that. This is the evidence lower bound that I started with. It's my expectation under my simple distribution Q, a log ratio between my complex distribution P over my simple distribution Q, right? I'm gonna rewrite the division as a subtraction, log of P of X and Z minus log Q of Z given X. I'm gonna do a subtraction of P, P of Z and an addition of P of Z. So these two terms go away because um, you're gonna divide by P of Z. So you get log of P of X given Z with my parameters theta. And the second term becomes a KL, a KL between Q of Z given X and P of Z. What do these terms mean? The first term essentially says that there's two things. I have a P distribution that takes in Z and outputs X. All right, I have a P distribution that takes in Z and outputs X, going from smaller latent space to my data. That has some parameters data. I have another distribution Q that takes in X and gives me Z. Go from high dimensional data X to feature Z. That has its own set of parameters phi. So what this first term basically means is that I'm gonna start with one particular data point, pass it through my Q model with parameters phi to get latent feature Z. I'm gonna then evaluate how well those latent features Z under my P model, 
P of X given Z allows me to reconstruct my input data X through my parameter state. All right, so that's what the first term is essentially saying. You're going through this loop, we're evaluating starting from X, the distribution over Z that I get by encoding X into latent features. And from those Z, how well I can again explain the log likelihood of my original data. That's my P of X given Z. All right, so essentially you have this input uh, encoder decoder process and you want this encoder decoder to reconstruct your original data as close as possible. That's your first term. The second term is a KL. If you've seen KL before, that's a basically a measure of distributions. It's saying that my Q of Z given X, so my distribution of latent variables that I infer from my data should be simple to P of Z, a prior, right? And usually we set this prior to be as simple as possible. For example, a Gaussian, so that um, the distribution of Z is as simple and interpretable as possible, right? So the distribution of latent given my input data should be simple. That's what this KL is doing. So that essentially explains your autoencoder's main structure. Um, I'm writing that the hint is, should be basically a feature, the Z, right? What I use to reconstruct my data, what latent variables I use to reconstruct my data. Uh, the whole goal is to use, use them as simple as possible, right? Maybe just eye color or side or front rotation of the face. That should be as simple as possible. If your Z is as complex as your data X, then there's kind of no point in defining a latent variable model. Great. So how do you actually learn these parameters? There's two, two sets of parameters you gotta learn. One is theta and one is phi, right? One in the encoder, one in the decoder. How do you learn these parameters? So I'm again gonna start from this objective function that we derived in the previous slide based on the evidence lower bound. There's two terms. One is the input output reconstruction term and one is the, the term that makes sure my latent variables are, are, are simple. So two sets of gradients you gotta compute. One is with uh, parameters theta and one is with parameters phi. So parameters with respect to theta, let's do theta first. Theta is actually easy. Why is that? So I'm gonna write out my objective. I'm gonna to try to take gradients with respect to theta. First of all, the second term has nothing to do with theta. And the second term is telling me how close my, my latent feature should be with a prior. That depends on the encoding process from theta to latent features. So that depends only on phi. So I can throw the second term away. The first term, if I wanna take gradients with respect to theta, there's this expectation over here. This expectation also depends on phi. The expectation depends on the encoded uh, latent features. It depends only on phi, not on theta. So I can bring my theta inside the expectation. And once I bring my theta inside the expectation, what's inside the expectation is just from the latent features, how will they reconstruct the data? That does depend on theta because that's a decoder, uh, but it's simple. Basically, I can approximate this gradient like you usually do with a uh, expectation over individual samples, an empirical average over individual samples, right? So essentially what it's saying is that if I have a bunch of input data that I've encoded into latent feature Z, and I have many of them, like maybe 32 in my batch, for each of these latent features Z, I'm gonna pass it through theta, my decoder model, to go back to my original data X. How well does the X actually reconstruct my original X? Each of them is gonna have some error. I'm gonna average over the N, the 32 of them in my batch, compute the total error, and update with respect to the gradient, okay? So that's easy. Uh, the other set of parameters we gotta learn is phi. Um, so theta and phi. Phi is a little bit trickier, right? Because if you look at this objective, um, you wanna take a gradient with respect to phi. The first term has an expectation with respect to samples Z that are generated using my encoding process with phi. Right. So whenever you take a uh, gradient with respect to samples, it's gonna be hard because sampling breaks the differentiability process. So you can't take samples exactly. In fact, the second term, the KL, also requires expectation over Q, log Q over P. So it also depends on an expectation with respect to the samples, latent features that are obtained from passing it through five. It's a little bit of a difficulty here, but it's a trick uh, called reparameterization that allows me to take these samples gradients, 
So what is your parameterization? Okay, typically if you have a distribution Q of Z and it's an expectation over it, you can write it as an integral, integral over Q of Z, whatever term that's inside the expectations, D of Z. And let's just assume Z, Z is Gaussian because in our case, Z is Gaussian, right? Z is a simple distribution that you choose to be Gaussian. <laughs> Let's say it's Gaussian with some mean parameters and some variance parameters. Then sampling the Q of Z, sampling the Z and the Q of Z can be done in two ways. One is just directly sample with respect to the Gaussian, right? If I have Gaussian with mean, mean two and variance five, I can treat that as a Gaussian, I can sample from it. The other way of sampling is to equivalently sample some epsilon from a standard Gaussian with mean zero, variance one. And I transform this sample that I have from my standard Gaussian into the sample from this non-standard Gaussian. And there's a rule essentially telling you how you can do this transformation. Basically, you gotta take this standard Gaussian sample, multiply it by the variance, and add the mean to it. Right? These two are equivalent ways of sampling the same output from my Gaussian Q of Z. Right? But while the first one doesn't allow you to backpropagate through it, the second one does. Why is that? Because observe that my expectation under Z, R of Z, that's a term that I care about, I'm going to rewrite the Z sample from Q of Z into sampling noise epsilon from a standard Gaussian, right? But once I have this noise, in order to transform it to Z, I have to multiply by the variance and add the mean, right? So that's basically my transformation function G. That G, you can then evaluate your R, uh, whatever function you have on the inside. And in that case, if I rewrite this in this way, and I want to take a gradient with respect to phi, observe that my expectation is now under standard Gaussian samples that have nothing to do with phi, right? In which case I can move the gradient with respect to phi inside the expectation. Previously, I couldn't move the gradient with respect to phi inside the expectation because the expectation was over Z that depended on what phi was. I couldn't move it inside. But now I have a, my expectation is based on a standard random variable that doesn't depend on Z and phi, which means I can move the phi inside. And once I move the phi inside, the term inside is differentiable with respect to phi. I can just take gradients with respect to it. Right. So that's a good thing. I'm not sampling z from the full data distribution with that mean and variance, which depends on phi, but rather sampling based on a standard Gaussian before transforming it into what it would have been if I had sampled from the original distribution. Some of you might have also seen this diagram. Right? If I have some data, and I have some parameters phi that together tell me what the distribution over Z should be. And I sample Z from this distribution. This sampling process creates a bottleneck in my computation graph that I can't back propagate through. The reparameterization, what it essentially does is it changes the sampling process to be sampling from a standard Gaussian. After I sample from a standard Gaussian, I'm going to transform this standard Gaussian with the parameters phi, which is the mean and variance parameters into Z. But once I've already sampled this standard Gaussian, everything else that's transforming is just differentiable. It's just multiplying by the variance and adding the mean. That's all differentiable. In which case, whatever output I get, if I want to backpropagate with respect to the five parameters, I can backpropagate it here. I'm skipping the randomness that I sample from. Okay, so that basically wraps up the derivation of VAEs. Right? Essentially, you have this model that you derive <clears throat> that has two separate parts, two separate parameters. One is an encoder parameter that goes from input data X to latent variable Z. The latent variable should be as simple as possible. And this encoder has some parameters phi. And also have a decoder model that takes in Z and outputs my original data X. This is going from my lower dimensional latent variables back to my high dimensional data. This is a decoder parameters with parameters theta. There's two training objectives. The first training objective is a reconstruction objective, which basically says that if I have input data X, I'm gonna estimate the distribution over Z as told to me by my encoder distribution. Right? A lot of samples X, 32 of them, encoding them into a set of 32 samples Z. And from these 32 latent variables Z, I'm gonna pass it through a decoder and see how well I can reconstruct my original data. And that should be as well as possible. That's the first reconstruction term. And also have this prior term. It tells me uh, under my inference distribution Q, 
what are latent variables I estimate, this distribution of latent variables should be as simple as possible as measured to with respect to a prior that is simple. And inside, we talked a little bit about this reparameterization uh, trick, which means that instead of using my Q distribution to get Z and sampling Z from it, I'm instead going to sample uh, epsilon using a standard Gaussian. I'm going to use this encoder Q to learn my mean and variance. And after I sample a standard Gaussian, I'm going to multiply by the variance and add the mean as told to me by the encoder distribution to get my sample Z. And this reparameterization is important because this allows you to back propagate with respect to these mean and variance parameters, which is the phi over here. Any questions about VAE? Great, so some applications. Uh, VAEs are really useful for, for both multimodal and single modal generation. Uh, one of the most important and most useful things VAEs can give you is that of disentangled generation, where you can basically control your latent variable Z so that they each represent one particular component, right? The same example that we saw previously, but illustrated here more for images, uh, one latent variable corresponding to the color, one corresponding to the background, one corresponding to the shape of the input and so on. How do you do this? Um, again, the two terms that you have, one is a reconstruction term, how well my input data X goes to latent variables and reconstruct my data X. That's the first term, that's not gonna change. But you can essentially play with the second term in order to get better disentanglement. I can play this distribution because this second term is telling me what distribution I want my latent feature Z to be from input data X, right? Do I want this latent feature distribution to be more disentangled do I want it to be simpler, more complex? What do I want my distribution of latent features to be? I can basically control it using the second term. It's actually a very simple way of controlling uh, how disentangled my feature should be. And that is by setting your prior, which is what you want your latent feature distribution to be, set your prior to be something that's disentangled. So set P of Z to be a factorized Gaussian that has uh, independent features between them. And in which case, Enforcing this KL will be equivalent to learning a set of latent features that are much closer to this prior P that are disentangled. Right? So essentially these folks found that adding a beta term in front of the second term allows you to adjust the weight of how much you're doing reconstruction of your input data and how much you're enforcing this uh, distribution of latent variables to be close to a disentangled one. So the original VAE sets beta to be one just based on the derivation. Beta VAE just tunes this parameter in order to make my distribution of latent variables more close to the prior and therefore more disentangled. But of course, it's a difficult problem. Uh, there's a lot of benchmarks and positive and both positive and negative results. Some cool things you can do in the multimodal case is again, play around with the prior. Uh, my prior over what these latent variables should be. You can actually factorize them into one that is common to both modalities, one unique to the first modality and one unique to the second modality. And we saw a glimpse of this during Tuesday's lecture, but you can use these factorized latent variables to learn uh, different partitions of different modalities, right? Given my common latent variable between your two modalities, that should represent the digit, digit nine. The first latent variable should represent the style in the first one. The second latent variable should represent the style in the second one. So for the same digit nine, you can rewrite it in different styles. And that allows you to do much more freeform generation. Right. By fixing, for example, the common latent variable, you can change the other, other two, and you can sample from them. You get a bunch of samples with the same digit but different styles. Likewise, you can fix one latent variable corresponding to the unique style in the first modality and sample different, um, sample different digits from it, zero through nine. And likewise, fix the style in the second modality and sample different digits from it. So those are both on, based on factorized VAEs. Yeah. So how would you determine what the latent variable corresponds to so what as is trial and error? Uh, great question. So this is, so it's actually trained to do it. Essentially, this what this VAE will look like is that you will have not one Z, but three Zs. Uh, three Zs over here. Z unique to the first, Z unique to the second, Z common. I would take my input data, I have two modalities as the input, encode them into these latent variables. That's the encoding process that we talked about. And a decoding process would take these latent variables, 
and output my data. But how do I actually decode it, right? Um, what is unique in the first and what is common in both together should decode the image in the first modality. What is unique in the second and what is shared to both together should decode the image in the second modality. And what is shared should be able to predict the label if there is a common label between them. So you're not taking <clears throat> all your latent variables and reconstructing all your data, you're taking subsets of your latent variables and reconstructing subsets of your data. Right. So if you train a model in this way, it's kind of forced to learn. Well, first of all, the prediction head forces uh, ZY, the common latent variable, to learn the common label between them, the digit line. And then you're forcing your model to use what's unique in the first to generate the first modality. Right. This what's unique in the first has nothing to do with generating a second modality. Right. So the model automatically learns to factorize it like this. Yeah. Well, the right comparison wouldn't be to supervise because the right comparison would be to like a fully unfactorized generative model, right? So essentially you concatenate your data, x1, x2, you learn one z, and you reconstruct your data concatenated x1, x2. Right, that would be, is that a baseline? You're thinking would it outperform? So the goal here isn't to predict, the goal is to generate. Yeah, to generate. Right, so if I just want to do prediction, sure, I have a prediction head, right? But now I want to, I want to like kind of control what I generate in the first one, control what I generate in the second one. The goal is to control the goal generation. Cool. And we saw these um these more recent text to image generation models yesterday. Uh, Dali, the first version of Dali was actually based on these VAEs. Right. We saw that you could take image, uh, encode it into a distribution and then you decode it from distribution back to the original image. Uh, and afterwards train an autoregressive transformer from text through your text tokens, a text encoder to get some text tokens and use those text tokens to predict the, the features in the middle of the VAE. So that uses VAEs with, uh, with a modification, which is that it's a discrete VAE. So it's not a continuous VAE uh, where the Z is a Gaussian with some mean invariance that allows you to sample continuous Zs. But in this case, you're learning a discrete VAE uh, basically through a code. Book. But the principles are the same. You have an image, X. You're going to learn an encoder distribution, Q of Z given X. I'm going to design my Q of Z given X not to be a Gaussian with mean invariance, but rather a uh, code book, so a categorical distribution over a very large code book. Once I have this Q of Z given X as a categorical distribution, my sampling process wouldn't be sampling from a Gaussian. It would be sampling from this discrete set of features. And then I have this output process, again, that goes from Z back to my input data X. That's my decoding process, right? Same idea as VAEs. Biggest difference is how I parameterize uh, the latent feature distribution. So this kind of goes into both generative, but also an example bit, right? Because if you're limiting Z to be exemplar-based, um, then you are more retrieving from one of these discrete sets. You're not exactly generating from any continuous feature. One of the biggest benefits of doing this discrete discrete VAE is that you're now more compatible with images or uh, with text. Because when you have text, when you have text, uh, because eventually you want to train a text to image model, when you have text and you're encoding it, you're also encoding them into discrete space. Right, your transformer is output something, uh, discrete tokens, and you can train this transformer to take in these discrete tokens in embeddings to predict the discrete codes in the latent vector of the VAE. So it's basically predicting these discrete codes. And once you have these discrete codes, you can then pass it through the decoder of the discrete VAE to generate the image. So that's VAEs at a very large scale in the first DALI model. OK, so summary. Variational autoencoders, um, after you understand the math, they become pretty simple to train. They have a pretty simple objective, balancing the reconstruction of input data to latent variables back to input data uh, with a prior over my latent variables. So that should be as simple as possible. Relatively easy to train. You have both the encoder and decoder, which is good because you can take data and encode it. You can do feature learning. You can also take 
the latent variables and decode it, you can do generation, um, which is good. Uh, some images with, with, with uh, VAEs are that it doesn't give the most high quality images because most like most of the time these reconstruction objectives are based on uh, log likelihood or mean squared error. These tend to not be the best objectives to give very high quality images. Any final questions about VAEs? Great. So even though VAEs may not be used that much nowadays, but they're important precursor to what is being used a lot nowadays, which is diffusion models. Uh, diffusion models work like this, right? So the core intuition is that if I have an image, it should be very easy to add noise to it, right? I can keep adding Gaussian noise incrementally, a little bit of noise at a time until I get a fully static noise vector, right? This noise vector, enough noise is gonna resemble like a standard Gaussian mean zero variance one noise vector. So it's very easy to add noise to things. Is it easy to remove noise from things? Reasonably well, right? If I have something that is a little bit noisy version of the original image, I should be able to reconstruct a more clean version of it. I should be able to remove noise, right? In computer vision, there's been lots of research over the years on denoising. So diffusion models basically operate in this idea. Uh, at multiple levels, I'm going to add noise to my original image to make them noisier and noisier and noisier and noisier and closer to a standard Gaussian. If I add enough noise, it should be just a standard Gaussian latent variable. So that's the diffusion process. We usually denote this as Q, starting from the original image x0, adding Q, which is adding a noise distribution at every step, that gives me x1 from x0, x2 from x1, slowly, slowly, slowly until I get xt, capital T. Diffusion process. And if adding noise is incrementally is easy, then ideally removing a little bit of noise at every step should also be easy, right? Leveraging work on denoising models. So I'm also gonna train a model that tries to slowly remove noise from noisier versions of my data. That's called the reverse diffusion process. Uh, I train a model, so this, this part is going to have some parameters data that you wanna eventually learn. And it's a reverse process that takes a more noisy version of the image. So for example, XT, and tries to learn a cleaner version, XT minus one. Eventually we do this multiple times, you should be able to go from the original, uh, the, the most noisy version, to the original image again, back to X0, okay? So two processes, encoding by adding noise, slowly. Uh, that's my Q distribution. So my Q of XT, given XT minus one, would be a Gaussian distribution, right? That is still centered at my original distribution, but my variance would perturb it by a little bit. Right. So still marginal distribution, but I'm gonna shift the pixels a little bit the left to the right by some variance. That can be seen as adding noise to your original data. Alpha is a parameter that tells you how much noise I should be adding at that particular time step. Right? You wanna eventually set each of these alphas to be small, so you're slowly adding noise towards diffusion process. Uh, but I'm gonna go into a little bit detail later how to set the alphas exactly. So the encoding process will add noise. Add noise is seen as you know defining a new distribution from the original image, but with some variance, we're perturbing the image a little bit according to the variance. Uh, so alpha the noise parameters. Uh, I'm going to try to learn a, a model for the decoding process. That's denoising, right? The reverse diffusion process is to remove noise as denoising. So there are parameters data here. I'm gonna learn, in some sense, it's almost autoregressive, where you start from my most noisy version, E of XT. I'm gonna learn X T minus one given X T, T minus two given T minus one, and so on until I try to recover uh, my P of X0 given X1, the cleanest version given the slightly less clean version, right? So I'm gonna try to learn all of these things. That's the log likelihood of the, the data, P of X, okay? Where P of XT, which is the final step, if you add enough noise, it can be seen as just a standard Gaussian. Okay. So in some sense, you still have this encoding and decoding process. So there is some similarity variation order encoder. In fact, the machinery, the techniques that we get from VAEs are gonna be very useful to derive the objective for diffusion models. So it's similar to variation order encoders, but there's a couple of main differences. The first main difference is that all of these, my data 
to more noisy versions of the data, eventually to something that is so noisy that it can be seen as Gaussian latent variables, uh, they all have to have the same dimension. Right? They all have to have the same data dimension. Because adding noise, my Q process was just adding noise by defining a Gaussian with that mean and shifting the image pixels around a little bit. That didn't change the dimension. Unlike VAEs, where each of the Q encoders ideally reduce dimension to get more compact data variables. right? So my encoding process wouldn't reduce dimension. My decoding process wouldn't increase the dimension. All the dimensions are the same. Um, and, and that would come with its advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, my latent variables are still high dimension. It's one explanation for why these diffusion models can be quite slow nowadays. OK. Another big difference is my encoder Q is not learned. Like in variation order encoders, you're learning both the encoder and the decoder with two parameters. So my encoder Q here is not learned, but it's rather predefined. It's predefined as adding noise according to that Gaussian with some noise parameters. So the noise parameter is something you can tune as a hyperparameter. Otherwise, there's no parameters in the encoding process of adding noise. And the third big difference is more a minor difference is that there's many latent variables. Of course, there's one big difference that you see from UAEs. There's many latent variables. Uh, each of these latent variables are all Gaussians by themselves. And eventually, you're going to vary them so that they become uh, some standard Gaussian. Right? So instead of just having data and one latent variable, it can be seen as a VAE with many, many, many levels of latent variables. So how do I learn these models? As I mentioned, same thing from VAE. You're going to start with your log factor of your data, log P of x. And P of x is basically this factorization, autoregressive, where you take most noisy, you remove a bit of noise, remove a bit of noise, remove a bit of noise until you recover marginal data. Um, that's like, it's a, it's a huge term with lots of multiplications. It's not going to be easy to compute, right? But as we said, if you have a P distribution that is very hard to compute exactly, what can we do? We can use variational inference to define a simpler distribution Q. It's much simpler, but ideally as close to P as possible. So this equation is basically our old friend, the evidence lower bound, the first term that we derived in VAEs. Expectation under a Q distribution that is simple, uh, log P, which is my difficult distribution, divided by the simpler distribution that you have chosen. Right. So there's old friend of elbow. And I'm not going to go through the derivation, but if you eventually derive it, uh, this has a great tutorial that actually goes through the derivation. It's going to be three terms. The first term is a reconstruction term, very similar to VAEs. This is a reconstruction term for uh, the very the, the, the very last step closest to my data. right? So essentially, um, under my distribution of latent variables x1 given x0, so under distribution of adding one step of noise, how well can I reconstruct from one step of noise back to the original image, right? That's kind of like the base case, the very last reconstruction term. There's going to be a prior term that tells me how close my xt at the final step is to a standard Gaussian. Just like in VAEs as well, you have this prior regularization term, how close my final latent variable is to a simple standard Gaussian. Uh, so those can be seen as two base cases, one at the beginning, one at the end. And of course, you have all your intermediate terms, right? Each of the intermediate terms can be interpreted as denoising matching terms. You're essentially saying, how well can I encode my data using noise at an arbitrary step, but also learn a reverse denoising process that removes the noise from that one step of noise that you just added, right? And you're going to sum over from 2 all the way to t minus 1. Right? So each of them, there's like a variational order encoder type encoder decoder measuring how well I can encode by adding noise and how well I can de decode by removing that small step of noise. So you can be seen as a multi-level VAE. A little bit more about this denoising matching term. What is this denoising matching term? Uh, every step, you have this additional noise. right? That is through a predefined noise function, which is a Gaussian standard st uh, at the mean with some variance that adds noise. You're essentially comparing, in this noisy matrix term, you're comparing the reverse noise process with what I learned in my model to be the removed noise process. Right? The intuition here is that I want to train a neural network 
to predict a cleaner image x t minus one from a noisy version of the image at x t, where the noise had been added. And this removal of noise process should be consistent with the addition of noise process. So this Q term is Q x t minus one given x t, and that is also kind of a removal of noise process. That's in some sense, the ground truth removal of noise process. Um, you can actually compute this proportionally by hand, not exactly, but proportionally, because my addition of noise Q is some Gaussian. To get the reverse, I can use Bayes rule, right? When I arrive A given B, if I want to get B given A, I can use Bayes rule to reverse it. So if I know what each of these adding noise steps are, I can also define what is in some sense the ground truth reverse noise process using Bayes rule. It's going to be proportional to some Gaussian because all of these are Gaussians. Bayes rule multiplication of Gaussians is also going to be a Gaussian. So that's the ground truth. I want to learn my parameter models of my parameter theta to match this removal of noise process. How should I choose what model to define? I'm again going to define it parameterized as a Gaussian with some mean and variance parameters. So again, this theta removal of noise process is going to be some Gaussian distribution that takes in a noisy version of the image and learns a mean and variance for the less noisy version of the image. Right. This is going to be a Gaussian. Um, right? Because the ground truth in some sense is a Gaussian, I'm going to define what I use to match it also to be a Gaussian. We can derive the KL of two Gaussians to be a Gauss, to be some close form, which is easy. Of course, when you have Gaussians, it can be seen as the, the, the decoder of your VAEs. To optimize it, there's going to be reparameterization trick involved this again. Right. Instead of sampling from this Gaussian, sample a random latent variable from standard Gaussian before transforming by the mean and variance parameters of the Gaussian. That makes it differentiable. Right. Take a little tutorial, they're going to go through the way you do the reparameterization. What is your general idea? Right. Um, you have three objectives, one at each end. The first one is just at the very last step, can you reconstruct? my original data from one step of noise added. That's the very last step. And then you have the very, uh, there's a step closer to latent variables, how well my final latent variable is to a Gaussian. And you also have these intermediate steps that at time two to all the way T minus one, encoding, adding noise, decoding, removing noise, how consistent this loop is. And just a little bit of, um, of a heuristic, uh, people find that each of the noise parameters that you add, ideally you want to add smaller noise at the beginning of a diffusion process, and you want to add larger amounts of noise uh, to the end of a diffusion process. Right? At the beginning, let the model just add a little bit of noise to the original image. By the end, you're already basically noise. It doesn't matter how much noise you add. OK. And one extension, um, this is actually a discrete step, right? You have x0, you add noise, you know, how many steps? It's a, it's a set of uh, discrete steps until you get to the final step. One very cool extension is they can convert this sequence of discrete steps into something continuous in the limit. We're not just having like, you know, five steps of adding noise, removing noise. It's almost going to infinite number of steps of adding noise and removing noise. Uh, that's why some of you might have also seen diffusion models interpret it as differential equations. Because differential equations basically take something that is a discrete time differential equation mm -hmm. and converting it into a continuous time differential equation where the number of time steps is in the limit infinite. Right? And you can still solve these things. Uh, think infinite layer latent variable model, not just VAEs with one layer or uh, discrete diffusion models with T layers, but rather infinite layer latent variable models. And then you can use some tools from diffusion uh, differential equations to solve it, even in the infinite case, right? And this gets really good results. Much higher quality than VAEs. Okay. Any questions about diffusion models before we jump into the applications? Yeah. Is there any question as to why the diffusion model, or diffusion models generate better results or less varying results than VAEs? Um, yeah, essentially because VAEs, they compress the representation very quickly. And they, so from, from like image to noise, like in one step, very quickly. 
and you try to decode from noise to image, right? Because because by the time you compress and you force applying the latent variables to the standard Gaussian, it's basically noise, right? Uh, diffusion models kind of really takes it at a much slower pace, where you're doing multiple levels, adding noise slowly, and in which case the model removing noise slowly is also helping the model uh, by a lot. Right? It's not forcing the model to, in one step, go from a really like five dimensional noise to 32 by 32 image, but just going from a relatively noisier version of the image to the original image. So I think it's a pretty, pretty neat idea. Of course, the difficulty was in uh, deriving how to, how, to, how to optimize these things. And the fact that they can be quite slow because you're not doing any compression. You're staying at basically the image space for many, many time steps. So it's hard to optimize, it's a little bit slow, but um, if you can do it, it gets really good high quality results. It's much easier to just remove a little bit of noise from the exact same image dimension instead of literally going from five dimensional noise to image level like VA used to. Right, so of course nowadays diffusion models are, are great, you get good results, but I mean one um, in some sense confounding variable is also the fact that you have huge amounts of scale being devoted to it. Huge amount of scale that allows you to solve the issues with the optimization, train on large amounts of data, and kind of optimize even though you have these like multi-level VAEs where the latent feature is still at the data dimension, which otherwise without scale, you wouldn't be. Okay, so how to condition? Of course, we don't want just image diffusion models. We want image diffusion models conditional on everything. Uh, but essentially, what you can do is that this kind that you started off with, which we, we, uh, we try to maximize the log language of, of the data, right? P of x. And we factorize this P of x into this reverse denoising process uh, from noise to less noise all the way back to my original data. We derive the elbow based on this using variational inference. But of course, if you want to condition it, just add the conditional on y. You have a new set of variational bounds to derive. Uh, but what these variational bounds eventually look like is essentially saying that at each step, I'm not going to remove a little bit of noise from my image. I'm going to remove a little bit of noise given the image and also the conditioning variable. So think I have a noisy version of an image with a text description. How do I get a less noisy version looking both at a noisy version of the image and the text description? Right, that's what these things are saying. Right. This is in some sense the most uh, naive version of doing it, where at every step of the decoding process, we're removing noise. Not just given the previous noisy image, we also given text, semantic map, label categories, audio, video, whatever you want to condition on. I would say most naive because um, it's the first thing you would think of, but the biggest advantage is that uh, the biggest advantage is that you have to retrain your, your diffusion models if you train it again from scratch. Right. But it works. I mean, some of the, the biggest text conditional models are trained like this from scratch using paired data as well because this requires you to have paired data X with the conditioning variable. Okay. Uh, yeah, so, so DALI 2, for example, DALI 2 gave much better results than DALI 1. DALI 1 used discrete VAEs as the encoder and decoder. DALI 2 used CLIP as the encoder. So that already gives you a boost because you're not training the encoder from scratch, you're rather training something that is already pre-trained and something that already aligns my image into a feature space aligned with text features. Uh, my autoregressive model that maps text to clip image feature embedding, same thing, I can train using paired data. And once you have these clip image embeddings, you can train a diffusion model on top of that to generate your data. So in this case, this was in some sense just trained using a paired data. Right? I had clip image embeddings that was this Y over here, right? So from a noisy version of the image and a clip embedding of the, of the text, how do I together get a less noisy version of the image? Removing the noise, right? So that's what is being done over here, right? So that's how DALI2 does it by training a diffusion model from clip image embedding to the, the, the image. Okay, so DALI2 Imogen kind of came out at the same time. OpenAI used their frozen clip embeddings. Imogen from Google used frozen T5 language model embeddings. 
Um, all of these are really good, very useful for for uh, for for looking at text for conditioning a diffusion model and text. Some fatal cases of Dali two, but where Imogen works well, where are cases where you have some some like unseen out of distribution compositionality. If you don't see black apples, if you only see green apples, Dali two fails on this. Imogen can do this better. And horse riding astronauts um, both still fail, but not nowadays models can can still do this. Can do this, I think. Yeah, question. So the, the typical in distribution one that you see is always um per person riding a horse. You never really see horse riding a person, so it's hard to generalize to new combinations outside what you typically see. Always a I mean always a challenge for any machine learning model. Cool. So that's conditioning. Um, another thing is that one one cool idea to get rid of the bottleneck where you have to keep all the latent features in a data dimension is to combine VAEs with diffusion models, right? So that's essentially what latent diffusion, uh, stable diffusion does, which is that they find that autoencoders are quite good at compressing uh, semantically. Or I think, I guess, autoencoders are quite good at compressing uh, perceptually uh, kind of the, the, the raw data features, but you can still use diffusion models to do semantic compression. So essentially what your model will look like when you combine autoencoders and diffusion models is you have X, goes through an encoder to get Z, right? So this reduces the dimension, go from raw data into like more semantic space. You can then train a diffusion model in the latent space, which is much lower dimensional than the image. So it's a diffusion process that goes from Z directly obtained from the autoencoder, slowly adding noise to, to Z of T, which is by then the standard noise. And from Z of T, I'm gonna do the diffusion, a reverse diffusion process where you're denoising back to the original Z. And we're doing this removal of noise process, you can add any conditioning you want, right? That was the conditioning on Y. If you have paired data, it can be semantic map, text, features, images, whatever. And once you go back to Z, you can then define the autoencoder VAE decoder right, to map Z back into original pixel space. So a combination of version autoencoders that does the initial compression, encoding, and decoding into latent space with diffusion models trained on latent space. So that's the idea behind a uh, stable diffusion. And of course, a lot of cool results. A lot of cool results conditioning on text. Uh, writing is still a challenge. Conditioning on semantic math. And also conditioning on these uh, bounding box, bounding box semantic, semantic bounding. One reason why this works is that you're not forcing a VAE to do all the heavy lifting. Right? If you just had a VAE, you just had a VAE, you would literally go from X to an encoder to ZT, which is a, a, the variable with the most noise, right? Um, so here you can overall, I, I misspoke. So this is not a variational autoencoder. This is just like a vanilla autoencoder. So you here, you don't have to enforce that this Z is standard Gaussian, like an auto, in variational autoencoder. But rather, all you're doing is you're taking X and you're reducing it dimension by a little bit into some latent space, right? And this, this feature can be quite informative. It can be very rich. It can be still pretty high dimensional, just not image pixel level, high dimensional. A lot of um, training details, tra training tricks, right? So I would suggest look at the paper for all the other details. Great. So that was mostly conditioning, but with uh, usually with paired data, right? In some sense, a pretty naive way of conditioning. Of course, if you had paired data, you could define your diffusion model to condition on it. Several ways of um, doing post hoc conditioning, where you have a condition diffusion model, let's say you've trained, you don't want to touch it too much. How do you condition it quickly? Uh, one general paradigm is classifier guidance. They call it classifier guidance in the diffusion model literature, but it's something that you've already seen on Tuesday, where if you have a model and you want to learn P of X given Y, that you want to condition on, use Bayes rule to reverse it. Now you get a product or a sum in log space of two terms, P of X, which is the unconditional model, and P of Y given X, which is 
a classifier. Essentially, tell you the samples they've currently generated, what uh, what likelihood do I classify them as the target conditioning variable that you want, right? So essentially, if you want to learn this model, you take the gradients. We're going to try to do two things. We're going to try to maximize both log p of x. So I should be generating data of high likelihood. And at the same time, maximize log p of y given x. I should be generating data that my classifier should recognize to be the target variable that I want to condition. Right. We saw in the language model case, uh, in diffusion model case, they also call it classifier guidance. Training a classifier is um, it, it is okay. It, it's it can be a little bit of work, but it's not not the not the most amount of work. Right. So it's called classifier guidance. One thing that is standard practice now is um, called classifier free guidance. Essentially, I'm going to start with this equation, uh, where you do the base rule. You get the unconditional likelihood and also the classifier likelihood. But a classifier likelihood, I'm going to do a weird thing where I do base rule again to get back the uh, x given y. Right, I'm not, I don't want to train a classifier y given x. I'm going to go back to x given y. And I can rearrange the terms. And what I eventually get is that my p of x given y should be a weighted combination of something that is conditioned, x given y, and something that is unconditional, p of x. So in some sense, this, what this equation is saying is that there is no such thing as an unconditional diffusion model. There are only conditional diffusion models. I should always train conditional diffusion models. The question is whether I use more of the conditional diffusion model with the y given, or do I use a conditional model setting the y to be some constant, right? So give y as zeros versus giving y sometimes. So it's something that's almost standard practice now. Um, you train diffusion models, you always have like some random features, you have some, some dimensions that you reserve in a diffusion model inside it. Uh, when I want to train an unconditional version, I just don't touch the data variables. I just set it to be some random or the mean or the zero. If I want to condition it, then I set these extra dimensional data variables to the Y that I want to condition on. Um, so it's called classifier free guide, guide, uh, guidance. This glide paper was the one that proposed it. Also a model by Google that's trained a very large scale. And then finally, these classifier free models are preferred to these classifier models. Great. So let me summarize. Yeah, we've seen a bunch of generative models. They're all likelihood based because we always wrote down this P of X. In the autoregressive case, we factorize P of X as P of X zero, X one given X zero, X two given X one and so on. Autoregressively, uh, you can exactly compute this likelihood based on each of the individual uh, log likelihoods. It's easy to train, you get exact log likelihood. Difficulty is that you got an autoregressively sample, which can be slower. We saw VAEs that had P of X, which is hard to compute. We use a variational lower bound by introducing a new distribution Q that was hopefully as close to P as possible, but much simpler. It can be fast and easier to train, uh, but the generation quality is lower. And we saw diffusion models where you had really high generation quality, uh, but with the constraint that you had to define these latent features with noise added, they are the same dimension as the images, so they can be slower to sample from. Uh, you can combine it with autoencoders, so you compress a little bit and you do diffusion in latent space, which just makes it a bit faster, but you still have to do this kind of like multi-level VAE, so it's still slower than your standard VAEs. We saw a bunch of ways of conditioning and controlling. Disentanglement is, disentanglement, or in other words, defining priors on your latent variables is one general way. And enforcing these priors using some KL, you can make the latent variables more factorized, more controllable to your liking. We saw direct conditioning where you have paired data. Uh, you can train a model that conditions on this paired data. We saw the interpretations in diffusion models where you're removing noise condition on the text, for example. And nowadays, I think people, in some sense, always train some condition model it's just whether the conditioning variable y is random or set to zero or is something that you actually want to condition on. We saw prompt tuning, which is more popular in language models. Keep the language model frozen, train an adapter from whatever you want to condition on into language model space. The adapter should be small and lightweight. Uh, 
we saw representation tuning where you pretty much more open a black box of a language model and you train a new self-attention that takes into account both the original language model and whatever features you want to condition on. We saw a classifier gradient tuning uh, using Bayes' rule, writing x given y as e of x and y given x, simultaneously generating data of high, of high um, likelihood given the unconditional model and also generating data of high likelihood that your classifier predicts to be your variable of interest and classifier free tuning, something that's quite specific to future models but seems to work pretty well. Right. So you're always treating a conditional model as um, as a weighted average of a conditional model and an unconditional model. Okay. And finally, also open challenges, um, ethical challenges, evaluation challenges, but also challenges with full-on generation, right? Generating much more data than you started with. For example, videos aligned with audio and text. And yeah, a bunch more resources, a bunch more open challenges. All right, any final questions about generation? If not, that's all. Uh, make sure you get your midterm report in by Sunday and good luck for the presentations next week.